uh, nutritional effects on blood chemistry and happy to welcome uh, his son Cal who's a great guy and Jamie you did a great job and we have a, a, a great representation of chiropractic coming forth. Thank you. Thanks to you. Yes, yes, the next generation and third generation in this case. That's right. So yeah, we're very excited about that. And thank you for that, uh, you know, generous introduction. Um, uh, welcome, everybody. And I would like to uh, thank you again for this opportunity uh, to address uh, our profession and explain the importance of something that most of us um, should be utilizing, but we don't. And, you know, I'm trying to still figure that out because I try to address everybody's roadblocks or fears. One-on-one, uh, -on -one, you can call me and contact me. I start off with this screen for the reason. You can take a screenshot. You can get out your phone, jot it down. Uh, please feel free to contact me uh, with any questions uh, um, basics. I'm not sure how to write up my scripts. What labs am I allowed to use? I'm a chiropractor. Is that legal in New York? Any questions you have come to me and I'll help you develop, uh, use, utilizing labs in your practice. It's such a critical part of practice. And I literally don't know how to navigate healthcare for a patient without labs. So I'm going to uh, share with you, it's just one hour tonight. So we have a, a category. Uh, we have 12 hours of presentation that we can do on this. So we had to pick one hour to bring you tonight. I hope to see you. Uh, I know I will see some of you at the NISCA convention uh, where we will have more time on Sunday morning while we're there to uh, go delve into some of the uh, other parts of exciting blood chemistries on, on things that everybody's interested and worried about. So I hope to see people there. So let's get on with tonight. And tonight's topic, uh, I hope you find value in, it's going to be on inflammatory markers. Inflammatory markers is the category that we call analytes. Analytes is just the fancy word for the name of a blood test. So when you look at a blood test, usually on the left side of the page, there's all of the names of the tests. On the right side of the page are the values with the reference ranges. So the, the most important thing to me to analyze as a healthcare practitioner is a person's inflammatory markers. Why do I think that? Well, when you distill any single condition that walks through your door, whether it's a stiff neck or something more organic like gallstones, uh, ulcers, um, leaky gut, chronic fatigue, uh, anything that's walking through your door, is a state of inflammation in some way or form. Now, when we were taught inflammation in school, it was three categories. Things had to be either red, hot, and or swollen. If it was any of those three components, then you had yourself inflammation. Well, these days we also have a type of inflammation that we call super creep. Super creep is cellular inflammation. And some of the inflammatory markers that I want to share with you tonight are about being able to detect cellular inflammation. What's so great about that? Well, that's like having, you know, the best sonar equipment in the world, because you're going to find inflammatory reactions and infections that are flying underneath the radar. So these are very exciting blood tests. They're very easy to run and very easy to understand. And if you're new to the game of blood chemistry, um, this is a fun place to start out for chiropractors and people into uh, any kind of doctoring, really, yeah, medical or, or because inflammatory markers are, are about the whole body. So I, I would like to present them to you in a, a systematic way. Um, there's going to be about eight or nine of them that I can present tonight in one hour. 
So take some notes. And again, if any of these are a key interest to you, feel free to contact me, Jay Forster at NutralWestNY.com. Um, okay, so the first slide, I'm going to jump around with my slides here, obviously, because this is a 12 hour presentation and we're just doing one hour for you guys tonight and you will get your CE. Um, so here is a familiar chart that we need to revisit because we get away from some of these basics when we're in practice for many years. And it's really important to visit it again to get the lay of the land because cellular anatomy is just as important as learning gross anatomy. These days, it's probably more important. So the reason why I wanted to bring this chart up first is to show you where inflammation begins on a cellular level. And also to tell you that when we learned about the brain of the cell, that in those days when I graduated in 1985, they taught it as the nucleus of the cell. These days, the nucleus of the cell is no longer termed to the brain of the cell. Now, we call the brain of the cell the cell membrane. So this is like the skin of the cell that surrounds it. Why is the cell membrane being, you know, uh, uh, termed this new brain of the cell? Well, because we have found that the the, on the outsides of the nuclear membrane and the cell membrane, but more on the cell membrane, there are receptor sites, receptor sites for various uh, um, electrolytes and, and glucose and fats and protein molecules that have to go from the uh, interstitial or extracellular fluid to the intercellular fluid and once those molecules can enter into the cell that's when the excitement actually begins because they go into this thing that we got drilled in our head through high school bio undergraduate bio graduate school and now postgrad i'm hitting it with you again is the powerhouse of the cell the mitochondria well the mitochondria has to be revisited because in the study of nutrition and blood labs and functional medicine uh, the big topic these days is mitochondriopathy please jot that term down go to dr google or whatever your preferable search engine is and check out the subject matter of mitochondriopathy and revisit something that you may have put by the wayside as you get busy with life and work and practice. Why? Because if the mitochondria processes the glucose, the fats, and the protein molecules properly, then we usually don't get an inflammatory response, especially if it's clean. Now, you can process a chemicalized protein and, of course, get a, a, an inflammatory response. What's a chemicalized protein? Well, that's simply uh, some meat that has pesticides or, or, or antibiotics or if they're the... the uh, the uh, animal was fed grain and the grain was sprayed with glyphosate, which is the Roundup. This is uh, the whole, um, you know, uh, toxic chemical food environment that we're living in these days. And you have to learn to shop and, and eat organic and keep your diets to vegetation. It doesn't mean to never have protein, but keep protein to a real minimum. And, and if you are interested in, in good nutrition and diet, also please feel free to contact me after the webinar for that. Uh, so that's um, for the cell and the mitochondriopathy. Uh, that's really what I wanted you to revisit and check out and the brain of the cell being the cell wall. Um, the next slide I want to cover for you is going to be, uh, one yes, I just want to cover one more thing before we leave this cell. Um, there's two types of inflammatory markers that I um, uh, get for patients regularly. One of them is called a 
SED rate, SED. The other is called an ESR. They're very similar. Erythrocyte sedimentation rate and SED rate are the same. You can do it through the blood or the urine. But what I will tell you uh, is um, that both of those are called generalized or systemic type of inflammatory markers. So you're not gonna get a very specific piece of information when you order an ESR or an SED, and both of those are synonymous. Now, the targeted type of inflammatory marker you'll find is called CRP. That stands for C-reactive protein. That is targeted for more of a cardiovascular type of problem. So you see, of the inflammatory markers you'll be able to order, you'll be able to zero in on some systems that your patients might be struggling with. And I'm sure you all have patients with a cardiac history. And then you have patients that have systemic type of inflammation. And by systemic, I don't want to take for granted that everyone knows what I mean. That means something traveling throughout the bloodstream. And where does blood travel? Blood travels everywhere except for hair and nails and scar tissue. So those are called necrotic tissue or dead tissue. Um, so those aren't going to have blood supply. But the rest, every other uh, uh, piece of tissue, every one of your 300 trillion cells that make up a human body are receiving systemic blood supply. Uh, so the next slide I want to get to with you uh, is one of my favorites because it tells you about two things. Uh, well, three things really, but let's cover it in succinct. The first thing is it's called homocysteine. Now, homocysteine is is that's how you order it. When you when I write it on my forms, I order it as the word homocysteine. And this is an inflammatory marker that's mostly about the liver and the liver cell cycle. And the specific cell cycle, and there's five of these cell cycles that we study in, in mitochondriopathy and methylation, but this cell cycle converts methionine. And methionine and homocysteine have to do a dance back and forth. And that's mostly done through a B12 conversion. And the type of B12 that is used here is called methyl B12, known as methylcobalamin. So if you're using any of these B12 products in your practice, uh, know that there are four types in the world. Most people only know about two, methylcobalamin being one of the most popular and best forms that I recommend. Um, another good form, not very often recommended, but it, it is uh, inexpensive and it's, it's utilized a lot in the nutrition world is called cyanocobalamin. And that is derived from cyanide. And that does not mean it's going to poison you. Okay. Now the other two types of B12 uh, are hydroxo B12, hydroxocobalamin, or uh, adenosyl cobalamin. And adenosyl cobalamin is kind of going to come up in the next part of this topic when I teach you about homocysteine conversion. Now, I want to tell you that homocysteine is a little fun to teach the patient about because homocysteine is one of those key inflammatory markers that measures what we call ROS. And, and the term ROS stands for reactive oxidative species. Now, oxidation is the aging of anything that's exposed to oxygen. And I think it's important to go over with your patients the difference between the word oxidation and oxygenation. Oxygenation is very good. As human beings, we really thrive on that O2. But oxidation is the loss of O2. So it means you're going to age and you're going to wrinkle more. And, and, and just a side note on aging and wrinkling and oxidation, and this especially is for the vein people, uh, how to reverse oxidation is we have a supplement at NutriWest called homocysteine redux. 
and it literally reverses this process of oxidation. And it's mostly done through B vitamins. And of course, the B12 and the folate, the B9, are going to be in this product. But there are other ways to also reduce homocysteine levels. And just for a ballpark figure, uh, because again, this is a one hour sort of a briefing and introductory kind of get you interested in lab diagnosis moment. Um, uh, homocysteine is uh, usually optimally found at uh, uh, a reference range of below 10.5. Now, I want you to understand that my personal reference ranges in my practice are very different than the ones that are given on blood tests because the one on blood tests are reference ranges that are designed around the average of our country. They are national averages that are computed and some of them are even manipulated. So, do you think the average health of this nation is something that you want to use as a reference range with the SAD, Standard American Diet? You know, obviously not. We're having a, a huge problem of obesity, which is coming from leptin resistance in this country. And leptin resistance is not allowing people to know when they're full or satiated. And so they go back for seconds and thirds. Now, those people are definitely running B12 deficient because with processed foods and leptin resistance, you deplete your B vitamins as well as a polluted environment. For those of you who live in a metropolitan environment, obviously in the country, you're going to have a lesser oxidation rate. As you move toward a salt water environment, go toward the uh, south or north shore and get a home on the water, uh, you're going to get an increased oxidation rate. Uh, the two things I, that will, will have a human being oxidize faster than their chronological age and drill this through for yourselves and your patients is carbon monoxide and there's a couple of ways to get that number one you can smoke cigarettes number two you can suck on a tailpipe you'll get carbon monoxide number two is get a vitamin c deficiency and the way you can get that is by eating sugar eating sugar will bind collagen fibers subdermally and when you do that you get wrinkles and when you get wrinkles, you look older than you are. So make sure that you're not eating sugar and make sure that you're not smoking cigarettes and breathing in on car fumes. And learn how to check your inflammatory markers and learn how to reduce oxidation, reduce reactive oxidative species. There are many ways to reduce oxidation in life. Uh, okay, let's jump. To, well, you know, before I move on, let me give you a good tidbit on this, because uh, in the advanced course, we cover MMA. You'll see that there, homocysteine and MMA. MMA stands for methylmalonic acid. And methylmalonic acid, <laughs> this is almost a joke. How many of your patients walk into your office with one of their um, uh, uh, concerns of their health being fatigue? I mean, let's get real. You know, probably at least eight out of 10 come in with that complaint. Well, if you're not running a methylmalonic acid test regularly on labs, then you're missing an adenosyl B12 deficiency on your patients. And by the way, that's an easy fix. Now, if the methylmalonic acid is elevated, if it's not, then you know that you've ruled that out. And again, that's good doctoring because doctors rarely beeline to the answer of the cause of anything. We do what's called differential ruling out. And we say, it's not this, it's not this, it's not this. Oh, it makes sense that it's this. And then we go down that route. And then we prove it with an X-ray, any kind of imaging, a blood test, a urine test, a saliva test, a, a urine test, all these different hormone tests that are available to you these days. There are so many labs available to you. I encourage each of you to please get to that email and contact me after this and say, you know what? You said something about hormone testing and I have some patients going through menopause or I have 
have a lot of teenagers with menstrual issues, uh, irregular cycles, this and that, going through a lot of premenstrual pain and problems. All of this is manageable through labs. And by the way, the trend in the lab world, I'm doing this for, for 40 plus years. So the trend in this world is sending people home with home test kits these days. They're not even going to labs. So they're less expensive. They don't have to inconvenience themselves. And then that stuff is prepaid and they drop it off with UPS and you will get the electronic transmission of the reports in about 10 days from your uh, respective vendors. So, I mean, the whole thing is getting mainstreamed and electronically convenient. So I encourage you to jump on board. I will literally walk you through the hand and baby you through any of this. I know it feels insecure at the beginning, but I'm doing it for so long and you're all my brothers and sisters, so I'm happy to help. So here's our next one to go through, because I think, yeah, we're about halfway through the program here, and I still got a bunch I want to cover for you. Again, the subject matter tonight is inflammatory markers and uh, how to, um, you know, uh, depict them with simple lab diagnosis tests that we can all just send our patients for. And you can do this on every patient. And then to tell you the supplementation and some of the dietary and lifestyle guidance that will come with any of the highs and lows. Now, sometimes something could be too low or too high, but sometimes the lower something is the better. You know, like you can never be too rich or too thin, or you can never have a homocysteine too low. So no, uh, not everything is like that. Sometimes, uh, as in homostasis, we are looking for a balance and something that has too little or too much could be a health problem. And then other things don't work that way in lab diagnosis. So after you do, three, four, 10, 20 of these, you start to get to see the pattern and you start to feel secure with them. And then you bounce a couple of questions off me, you shoot me an email and I'm happy to help. So here we are going into iodine. This is, brings up an important point. There are inflammatory markers that I use and call inflammatory markers. And a lot of doctors that have come to my seminar say, I thought iodine was something that told me about the thyroid and goiter and things like that. And that is all true. But we have found over the past decades that many of these things that seemed targeted are more generalized. And this is a perfect example of one. And the next one I'm going to get to down the road is going to be uric acid. Um, I have to make a note on that one. That's gonna be a really important one to cover tonight. Um, that uh, iodine used to be targeted only for goiter and thyroid. Uric acid used to only be targeted for kidney stones and gouty arthritis, but I'm gonna tell you why these are not such targeted things and they're very generalized and systemic inflammatory markers. So here's an interesting fact about iodine. And by the way, how do you run iodine markers, the analyte on a blood test? You simply write down iodine on your request. What's a request? Well, you can print up, um, private um, uh, request forms. And again, I will scan and email you the ones that we use in our office and you can copy it and put your logo in there and your MPI number and your signature and all those things and make it your own. Um, or laboratories will supply you with their own sheets and you can just check off the test you want and send the patient back to the lab. Real easy stuff. So, so, Iodine has become a systemic inflammatory marker in our practice because here's an interesting fun fact, everybody tune in. Iodine is found in the nucleus of every single cell in your entire body that has a nucleus. Now, the only cells in your body that don't have nucleuses, and you have about four to five hundred million of those, is RBCs, red blood cells. They carry hemoglobin and oxygen and copper and iron 
and other things, but there's no nucleus in a red blood cell. And there's four to five million of those normally in a body. So there's the hint when you look at RBCs on a CBC, complete blood count, you want to get that number at about 4.5. It's times seven zeros. So iodine being in every single nucleus of every other cell of your body outside of RBCs means that it's an, inflam an anti-inflammatory mineral. If your patient is iodine deficient, and here's the crazy thing, I run iodine on probably 60 to 70 percent of the blood tests I send out. And to give you an example of what that is, I run approximately 800 blood tests a year. So about 600 of those people are getting their iodine check. And the levels run from about 40 to 90. And I'm going to give you the best way to figure out optimal levels because patients aren't coming to your office for average health. They're coming to you for optimal health. And by the way, if you're doing some lab diagnosis and you're running these inflammatory markers and you're taking time to report and explain this stuff to your patients and dispense supplements, you need to charge more. So your fees go up. So your income goes up. So you're also retailing all these products. You're also charging more for the visit because there's a consult involved here. So this is all legitimate charge that's going to increase revenue. And on average, most doctors that contact me that have listened to me are telling me averaging about $50,000 per day or so if you're working three days, three days a week more, then you're going to bring your income up about $150,000 this year. So that's the average feedback that I get from a doctor. Now, the supplement we use for iodine deficiencies, and most <laughs> patients will have them, and that is what's causing a lot of their, by the way, skin deficiencies are classic with iodine deficiencies. A lot of eczema, psoriasis, seborrheic dermatitis, all of these kinds of things are usually iodine deficiencies. I find a lot of patients in their 40s. Now, I said it's 40 to about 90, the range. So if you go 40 plus 90, 130, that's the total. Take 130 divided by two. That's going to give you the middle of the middle. So uh, what do we have? Uh, uh, 65. So your patient should be running about a 60 to a 70 on the rerun of the blood test. So you give them the supplement called Iodine Rescue. That's the name of it, Iodine Rescue. There are 22,500 micrograms per pill. That is a fragment. It sounds like a lot, but it's not. It's a fifth of a gram. You give them one a day, and you do that for four to six months, and you rerun the iodine, and you can run it by itself or two or three of the other inflammatory markers that came up high. And then you show them their progress. Then they start telling you that their rashes are disappearing. And how do you think that makes you feel? And you're still adjusting them the same way. But now you ran the blood test, you found the deficiency, you gave the supplement, and now you've deflamed them. That's doctoring. That's a primary health care provider. And that's what chiropractors are defined as these days. We are no longer spinal and sciatica and stiff neck specialists because every profession is learning how to adjust. It's no longer a chiropractic specialty. Osteopaths are learning how to adjust and acupuncturists are learning how to adjust and their physical therapists and occupational, everyone's learning how to do manipulation and adjusting. So we have to step up the game. We have to get into lab diagnosis and we have to teach people about their health and adjust them because we're chiropractors. That's what we do. So the next slide is just a quick list of where can I get iodine from in my diet? Safe places are the ones that don't have the lines through them. Why do I put lines through yogurt that a lot of people think are healthy, is a healthy food? Navy beans, which do, there is an exception. I'll give you an exception there. Uh, strawberries and cranberries. That should be fruits and vegetables, right? Healthy, but wrong. But let's cover it real quick because this is important. 
Yogurt is not a healthy thing for a couple of reasons. Number one, that's mostly 98% of the industry is deriving this product from a cow milk product. And most cow milk products are not safe. There are a couple of companies out there that are making it from goat milk. And I would tell you, if you're a yogurt lover, lean toward that one and keep it to a minimum. What's a minimum? Have a half a container twice a week. If you love this stuff, that's not going to take you off the planet. But I would not encourage yogurt eating. It doesn't give you more lifespan. And in fact, it's a processed dairy product. So it's not going to be good. Navy beans. Beans in general have a very high lectin count. High lectins equal high inflammatory reaction. We call that in the study of mitochondriopathy, a cytokine storm. Please write that word down and to go to Dr. Google and check out that one along with mitochondriopathy. Cytokine storm. C-Y-T-O-K-I-N-E cytokine storm. If you would like articles written by really smart people that are part of the NutriWest team, like Lynn Tui and, and, and uh, uh, Dr. Murphy and Dr. Lundell, I'd be happy to forward you published articles that have made it into journals. Very interesting things on cytokine storms. How do you get around the cytokine storm of a navy bean? Because in fact, beans are healthy. They're loaded with good protein molecules and fiber. What we do is we soak them overnight and we pressure cook them the next day. And then you can eat them. Because what soaking them overnight and pressure cooking them does is it makes them softer and it breaks down the lectin count. And then they taste just as good and they're nutritious. Now, if you'd like to purchase that type of bean and not go with the process, there is a company out there by the name of Jovial, J-O-V-I-A-L. They're sold in glass jars. There's no preservatives or additives. And this company soaks them overnight, pressure cooks them for you. And they make three different style beans. So if you like a three bean salad or you like a chili type of a meal, feel free to do it that way. If you're a person who doesn't eat meat and you like to include beans in your salary, more vegetarian, vegan style, please do your beans that way. Why do I cross out strawberries and cranberries? Because in fact, fruit is a driver of uric acid. And here's the next topic I'm going to go over, but I don't have a slide for you on this. So bear with me. Uric acid is again an inflammatory marker like iodine that's been touted as a targeted inflammatory marker to gouty arthritis and kidney stones. And that's truth. But now we also know that fruit, the sugar in fruit, drives up, that's called fructose. Those molecules drive up the uric acid levels, which is the conversion of purines in the body. And when the uric acid levels are driven up, it causes inflammation. Well, how's the inflammation going to show in patient A, B, and C? Well, in patient A, it shows as hyperglycemia or maybe even diabetes. And we're going to go over in another inflammatory marker in a minute that's going to cover all kinds of things about sugar. The second thing that uric acid can drive up is um hypercholesterolemia so your cholesterol and your lipid rates and your and your ratios and your triglycerides can all get whacked from an increase in uric acid levels so we covered the glycemia the sugar the uric acid levels and then the third one is hypertension also known as high blood pressure so this simple thing that seems simple uric acid is now opened up all kinds of doors and is connected to an elevation from fruit. So that's why strawberries and cranberries and all fruits are out, except for kiwis. And they must be organic, of course. And there are other things that are technically fruit that are fine, like avocado, avocados. But if you, again, like a list of some of these things, uh, and we get into all the technicals of this in the practice, please contact me, Jay Forster, at NutriWest. Com. Happy to answer your questions. Let me move on to the next one. I am watching the clock, doctor, uh, so I will behave. Let's go to the one I just mentioned, which is about sugar. 
and that is going to be here. Sugar is not a food. So you might like my little quote at the top if you're a Guns N' Roses fan. I used to do a little, but a little wouldn't do it. So a little got more and more. And that's why sugar is not a food. Sugar is a narcotic because it follows the classic pattern of I used to do a little, but a little wouldn't do it. And so you have a little more and a little more and a little more until it satisfies you. It's almost like numbing out receptor sites for opiates. And then they just keep needing a little more and a little more in order to get the effect. Well, sugar is an inflammatory food. And it also uh, can uh, trigger cancer cells uh, through an inflammatory response and a cytokine storm. So we optimally look for sugar levels to be between 70 and 85, but really the lower the better. I will tell all of you, never, ever, 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 ever allow a patient to take a blood test without fasting. How long should they fast? five to eight hours. There's two ways to do that very simply in our busy 21st century lives. Uh, 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 one is is uh, to um, get up in the morning and go to the lab and, and then have breakfast because certainly you weren't eating while you were sleeping. Am I allowed to drink before the test? Yes, up to four ounces of water. No tea, no coffee, nothing else, up to a half a glass of water. The other way to do it for people that tell me, there's no way I can go in the morning. I have my workout, I have my kids, I have work. Okay, no problem. Finish breakfast by 7 a.m. Go about your morning and then go about 12 or one in the afternoon on your lunch break and then have lunch. And in that way, you're fasting, we're gonna get accurate data and you're not skipping any meals, beautiful. Now, the glucose reading you're gonna get is a snapshot. And that's not gonna tell you more than what was going on with their glucose reading that exact day. And by the way, the word glucose is not really sugar. Glucose is the word for the blood sugar. That's the sugar in systemic circulation. But the sugar on the table that people are putting in their foods and coffee and so on is sucrose. And sucrose is a disaccharide and has to be broken down by insulin, which causes its own problems. And if you come to the seminar uh, at the NISCA convention, we're going to embellish on all of the problems that can come from sugar, like insulin resistance, hormonal problems, and, and ovarian problems, and, and miscarriages, and fertility issues, and all kinds of ripples from that we'll have the luxury of time. So, because we'll be covering a lot of these same topics, but of course, we'll go much further. Um, now, if you'd like to get a three month average of your sugar and you don't want to go every day for a blood test and then take it times 90 divided by you know, 90 and do all the math, um, you can simply order an A1C, that's Apple One Charlie. And then after you write A1C, you put the word glyco, G-Y-L-C-O, hemoglobin, which you can abbreviate as HGB. A1C glycohemoglobin, and you will get back another number. And that will range somewhere between the high four, say 4.7, 4.8, and that can go all the way up to the sevens. Now that's a tight scale. So a tenth of a point actually means something. Whereas in your glucose readings, I told you that optimally 70 to 85 is good. So a 70 and a 75 is gonna be about the same, about the same, and that's five whole numbers. Well, in the A1C, we're not talking five whole numbers. We're talking five tenths of a number is a big deal. So if you have a 4.9, that's excellent. If you have a 5.3, that's also okay. But if you have a 5.6, you're in trouble. And you see, that's only tenths of a point difference. And you just need a little bit of experience to get comfortable with these numbers. So please dive into this with me a little bit. I'll take you by the hand. We can walk through it both on the screen. I have doctors emailing me and we can look at it, you in your office, me in mine, and we can go through it step by step. And then you can get in touch with the patient right after and you can go through it with them, with your notes. <clears throat> Let's go to the next inflammatory marker. This one I really like a lot. 
because it is fun to do things that you're not supplied with. This is called an anion gap. Now, some of the laboratories have software that will do this for you, and some of them don't. The anion gap, first of all, is a general inflammatory mark. It is not targeted. So this is systemic, and this is going to tell you if somebody is inflamed in their blood. And what would you give a person supplement-wise if they are inflamed in their blood? Well, besides having them drink sufficient amounts of good, clean water, we have a product called ProEnzyme, which is a proteolytic enzyme. And proteolytic enzymes go around like little Pac-Men, and they collect up all of the free radicals, which are extra electrons that are in your blood as a result of an inflammatory response. That's what happens. So the proenzyme will eat up the electrons, which takes down the inflamm inflammatory reaction. Um, the other thing we use is called total FLM, FLM short for flame. That is more of the uh, herbal seasoning approach that everyone is now familiar with, uh, more of a turmeric and a curcumin approach, very effective very different from proenzyme. Proenzyme, again, is a proteolytic approach, knocking down inflammation by doing, uh, 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 eating up uh, uh, free radicals. Whereas the total FLM is ramping up the immune system and getting a greater inflammatory response, not by a proteolytic enzyme uh, approach, but by speeding up and ramping up and, and, and inflammatory approach. Now, this product is so effective that if you have a patient with an autoimmune disorder, which of, or, which of course is an immune system that's already ramped up, and you give them FLM, they're going to ramp up even more. Or if you give someone without an autoimmune disorder this product and you leave them on it too long, they're going to start to simulate an autoimmune disorder. And what that tells you is that these products work. You have to know what you're doing. So allow me to guide you through it. How do you calculate an anion gap if the software from your particular lab doesn't supply it for you? It's fun and easy. All you have to do is take the sodium, which is usually between 140 and 145. Keep that number right on the side. Then go to your chloride and your CO2 and add those together. Together, Chloride is usually between 100 and 5. CO2 is usually in the, in the mid-20s. Between 26 and 28 is optimal. You'll add the chloride and the CO2 and subtract it from your sodium. So let me give you some quick numbers just as an example. And you're going to see. And I'm going to tell you that anything that's 16 and over, you got a, a patient with a problem. And you can give them these products, take down the inflammation, rerun these electrolytes. It's just sodium, potassium, chloride. It's only three of them. And then you're going to know all about their anion gap, which is an inflammatory marker when you do the math with these sodium, potassium, and chloride analytes that people are looking over and missing the valuable information that you can suck out of this data because most of the labs will not calculate this for you, this anion gap. So... Numbers, for example, if the chloride is 100 and the CO2 is 25, that's 125. We're going to subtract that from the sodium. Let's say that's 145. So that's a 20-point differential. That's over 16. That patient is highly inflamed and in trouble. So you just have to plug the numbers in exactly like it says in the formula line. Sodium subtracted from chloride plus CO2. Anything over 16 is trouble. Single digits, optimal. I get lots of patients on the second run, seven dates and nines. And a 10. Okay, let's not split hairs. But they do come in 15, 16, 17s. I had several of them today. Uh, the last thing I think we can cover, I do have time for with everyone uh, let me give you another fun one to calculate this is called a waist hip 
index. This is an easy way to check flame status or what we call inflammation in the office. And what do we do to patients for a living? We deflame them. Really think about all the diagnoses. What's the suffix that equals inflammation? The suffix is itis, I-T-I-S. What do patients come in with? Dermatitis. They come with, with conjunctivitis. They come with, with pneumonitis and bronchitis and, and, and every kind of itis in the world, hepatitis and, and, and uh, you know, even the meglies are itises with hepatomegaly and splenomegaly. Everything's an itis. So, so there's tonsillitis. So, so if everything's an itis, then everything's in a state of inflammation. And then each patient exhibits it in their own way. And now you can target in and exactly know how to test it and how to supplement it and guide them through their diet and lifestyle. And again, I will give you all of my 40 plus years experience on the side. You can make your notes. You go back into the treatment room or on the phone or the Zoom with your patient, and you are the expert now. Um, so what do we do with waist hip index? Well, it's exactly an index. It's waist divided by hip. That's why it's an index. So you put the tape measure around your patient's waist, exactly at the line of the umbilicus, the belly button. And you're going to get a certain number. Jot the number. You're going to be dividing it by the hip index. The hip index is exactly around the femurs. Do this to yourself when we hang up. Put the tape measure around your hips at the widest point. Obviously, women are built different. They will have wider hips and narrower uh, around the uh, uh, waist. Men are going to be a little wider around the waist and maybe even around the hip. Therefore, you will see the quick reference range. Females normal below 0.8. Males are normally below 0.95. We're simply built different, folks. So do your two measurements. Divide the waist number by the hip number. If it's 25 or less, you're in good shape. Does that number sound familiar? It should, because it's the same number as your BMI, your basal metabolic index, which these days, in my books, needs to be 24, 24.5 tops, not even a 25 acceptable. What have they done with the FDA and the new numbers? They've now made it that a 26 and 26.5 is acceptable because of the obesity this country and everybody gaining weight they don't want people to feel bad that they're not hitting good numbers and so now instead of teaching people how to get healthy which is what we're doing here tonight they're allowing people to continue their poor diets and poor habits and they're increasing the number this is sick thing so we're going to turn it around. We're going to go in the office tomorrow morning and we're going to teach our patients that we can measure inflammation on them. We can check general things. We can target things. If they're having sugar troubles, if they're having cardiovascular troubles, if they're having aging related problems called oxidation, and we can check all these things. I hope you enjoyed tonight's uh, uh, and and um, I would like to leave you with a message. I like to do this every time I visit with doctors. Um, I would like you um, to all think of um, a way that you can present your service to your patients, that they're going to leave your office after their next visit, and you're going to give them what we term the wow factor. They're going to leave your office and they're not going to have words for the experience they just had. They're going to just be wowed. What a service. What a great practitioner. How professional. I'm already feeling better. I thought of somebody I have to send to him or her. Give them the wow factor and make him leave your office speechless. Thank you very much. I appreciate